Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Last time I touched on Annihilus was at the end of the Kree Scroll War, where he temporarily made it into our world. Let's pick back up with his next appearance in Marvel Team Up Volume 1, Issue Number 2, featuring Spider Man and the Human Torch, written by Jerry Conway and published in 1972. The comic opens with Johnny Storm standing beneath the bridge, pondering life while an older gentleman walks up behind him. The man introduces himself as Nathaniel and wants to know what has the lad so upset. Johnny, in a sour mood, wants to know what isn't. Nathaniel is drunk but passes on some advice to Johnny. If he's feeling down, he needs a friend. Johnny thanks him for his advice before taking off at a dash towards the water. The old man is worried about this kid running in that direction, but as Johnny flies away, he flames on while introducing himself as the Human Torch. After seeing such a sight, the old seaman swears off drinking. To ensure he doesn't treat the pledge too lightly, he needs to seal it with another drink. Twilight stretches over the city as Johnny finds who he is looking for, Spider-Man. The torch attempts to get Spider-Man's attention by burning through some of his webbing. Wow, so rude. All the while asking Spider-Man if they can have a talk without duking it out first. Spider-Man is rather put off by Johnny's approach and wants to know what's up. Again, Torch says he just wants to have a sit-down conversation. He thought they worked well together fighting against Sandman several weeks ago. Spider-Man doesn't really seem interested in Johnny's request. The Torch is put off by Spider-Man's standoffish attitude and the two part ways after crossing words. As the two leave, two villains watch from a nearby window. Wizard is telling Trapster that Spider-Man will make their group the Frightful Four once more. Sandman is next to arrive. When he hears the name Spider-Man, he's more interested in settling a score than teaming up with the Web Slinger. The wizard promises that Spider-Man figures into his larger plan, and that at dawn they will strike at the Fantastic Four. As dawn creeps over the city, Johnny is drinking a cup of coffee and reflecting on Nathaniel's bad advice. It's here that we learn he's upset that his girlfriend Crystal wouldn't come back to the United States with him, and notes that if Reed were here, he would probably attribute this funk to youthful depression. Reed and the others are currently in Chicago, and Johnny goes to get suited up. The front buzzer goes off, and Johnny is surprised to find Spider-Man has come calling. He attempts to speak with Spider-Man, but doesn't get a response. Johnny passes it off on the recent bad blood and heads down to have a talk with him. Once Johnny reaches the lobby, he's expecting to find a friend and instead gets a sucker punch to the jaw. He wants Spider-Man to explain himself, but then he sees Sandman standing behind Spider-Man. Again, Johnny wants an explanation. This time, Spider-Man backhands him while Sandman encourages the abuse. Johnny doesn't understand why Spider-Man is doing this as the blows keep coming. Johnny eventually reaches a breaking point and boots Spider-Man out of the elevator. Once Spider-Man is outside, Wizard informs his allies not to interfere with the fight between these two. Spider-Man, who still hasn't spoken, casts some webs right about the time one might begin thinking it's not Spider-Man, but somebody in a Spider-Man costume. The torch is covered in webbing, but quickly burns his way out once he flames on. Spider-Man follows this up with more webbing. That's when the torch realizes that Spider-Man isn't in control. He seems to be running on some kind of programming. Even so, the Human Torch still has to find a way to stop him. The problem is, is the Human Torch doesn't want to hurt somebody that he sees as a potential friend and ally. As Spider-Man dives towards the torch, he's forced to cut off his flames or burn Spider-Man. The force of the blow carries Johnny backwards, where he bangs his head and passes out. While he's unconscious, Johnny has horrible dreams of being betrayed. When he wakes up hours later, he finds himself bound in a straitjacket with a hardened paste around his legs. 
he quietly rolls over to take a look at what else he can see. Here he sees one of his captors, and here's another. Wizard and Sandman, a bit more of a belly crawl, allows Johnny to see the full room. The Frightful Four are using Reed's equipment in an attempt to tap into the negative zone. The Trapster and Sandman are giving Wizard a hard time, who attempts to convince them that only a genius like himself or Reed Richards could even comprehend a machine that is this complex. Trapster finally gives away part of what is going on here. Spider-Man has been put under some sort of trance. While Spider-Man stands there, Sandman can't help but take a cheap shot at him for the trouble he caused them last time they met. Again, Wizard demands silence from his allies, but as he turns back to the screen, a problem appears. For the three men who turn to look at the screen, time screeches to a halt. Their mouths go dry. Their voices are stilled. All they can do is listen to the crackle of static. A nihilist knows he is being watched and announces that he knows they are aware of his existence. Already the ruler of his own world, Annihilus is ready to finally get a win against the Earthlings. He decides to use their power to augment his own power. Sandman speaks up, not scared at all. In that moment, Sandman is frozen in place, while Wiz attempts to explain that Annihilus is too powerful for them to go up against. Wiz keeps attempting to back out on the computer, but Annihilus informs him that he's already locked out the machine's controls. With each passing moment, Annihilus gains more power over our world. Both Sandman and the Trapster stand ready to face off against Annihilus. The Trapster sends a series of flying bombs through the display, while Wizard continues to insist that all hope is already lost. It turns out the way they had the Human Torch bound up wasn't super effective, so he's capable of getting loose after a bit of a struggle. As soon as he's free, Sandman comes crawling into the room, and before he can finish talking, Johnny has already started tossing fireballs at him. The heat from these temporarily turns the Sandman to quartz. Johnny flies into the main portion of the lab where the shenanigans are afoot. The torch dodges the first shot, but the trapster follows up with a disc spraying some sort of liquid, which causes Johnny to fall from the air. The torch picks himself up off the floor, while the wizard demands that Spider-Man attack the human torch so he can concentrate on turning back Annihilus. Spider-Man jumps back into the battle with a solid blow on the human torch. As the Human Torch tumbles backwards, he insists that the Wizard will need him if he's going to turn back Annihilus. The Human Torch realizes the enormity of the situation and becomes determined to stop Spider-Man's attack. He doesn't get much of a chance. Trapster deadens his flames with more discs that are filled with a flame retardant, and then Spider-Man lifts him over his head and tosses Johnny into a wall. Spider-Man then comes in and picks Johnny up by his neck, preparing for another round of beating while the Human Torch pleads with him, attempting to break through the trance by telling Spider-Man that he's being controlled. He insists that the two of them are friends and that Spider-Man isn't a patsy, he's a free man. As he talks, Johnny can see the change overcoming Spider-Man as he covers his face with his hands and sinks to his knees. Spider-Man feels pretty rough at the moment, but Johnny extends a hand and calls him friend. The two are ready for their team-up and ready to clean up this mess. The wizard can't leave the controls, and the Torch and Spider-Man make short work of the Trapster. Johnny is shocked that the Annihilus, which is coming through the screen, is bigger than the one that they fought in the past, and stronger too. Johnny wants to know what the wizard has done, but he insists that Annihilus is gathering his power from Reed's machines. Annihilus agrees, stating that unless they can cut off the flow of energy, they are all doomed. The wizard is ready to find one of Reed's spaceships and abandon the planet, but Spider-Man isn't ready to give up. He then grabs the trapster and tosses him into the wizard. Afterwards, he's ready to help the Human Torch save the world, but Johnny tells him it's too late. He's at the computer, but he can't figure out the controls. 
Spider-Man chastises Johnny for backing out of college because then maybe he would have figured out that all they need to do is pull the plug. Annihilus was so busy gloating that he lost the rigid control needed to maintain control of all of the machines. Once again, Annihilus is turned back on the brink of breaking into our world. Both Spider-Man and the Torch are worn out, and the enormity of the situation they escaped begins to settle in now that the action has stopped. That's when Sandman enters the action once more. Not sure why Sandman didn't just take off, but sure, let this play out. Since he's still part quartz, Spider-Man is capable of shattering him with one solid punch. The Human Torch attempts to pay Spider-Man a compliment by asking how he did that. Spider-Man gets a little cocky, shakes Johnny's hand, and tells him that maybe someday they'll make something out of him. Ouch. Man, for being the Human Torch, he's the one that just got burned. The only thing left to do is to call the cops and report a break-in. Annihilus appears again the very next year. 1973 in Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue Number 140, written by Jerry Conway. We can tell from the cover Annihilus is finally successful in crossing over into our world. But how long can it last? Or is this cover just a tease? Annihilus, ruler of the Negative Zone, must not have very much to take up his time. We're told on the opening page here that there are not very many intelligent life forms here. Annihilus is spending most of his time attempting to find a way to destroy the Fantastic Four. If you want to know why, please watch my Annihilus playlist. He's reached a moment where he feels his moment of vengeance is near. Annihilus finally has the information he needs to destroy the Fantastic Four. He's going to target Reed's son, Franklin Richards. Annihilus flies to the border of the negative zone, where it meets normal space. From here, he proclaims that soon Reed Richards will be begging for mercy. Somewhere off-panel, another voice asks if it will finally be freed. It's an odd exchange. On the one hand, Annihilus seems surprised that whomever it is followed him there, while at the same time referring to him as his prisoner. One that lives only because Annihilus has a need for him. Annihilus then finishes his grandstanding, claiming within minutes he will rule over all. Back at the Baxter building, Reed ruins an antimatter gun he's been working on for months with a bad solder. He brushes it off, recognizes that he's been depressed ever since Sue took their son and left. As he mopes about the thing, Johnny Storm, Medusa, and Wyatt Wingfoot return via pogo plane from Oklahoma. Upon landing, the rest of the team can tell that Reed is bummed out. Ben snaps on Reed a little bit when Reed says the problem is a failed experiment, but then almost immediately apologizes. While they are standing there, a special alarm goes off, one that Reed knows means that it is Sue who is calling in. Sue is happy to have reached Reed and lets him know that something is wrong with Franklin. He's acting odd and she wants Reed to come and take a look at him. Reed agrees to come at once and before she can share her location, Reed loses contact with her. Reed then freaks out while everybody else attempts to calm him down. His freakout continues until Medusa picks up a wrench and slams it into the side of Reed's skull. Once he passes out, his body doesn't return to normal, but remains all stretched out. The Thing is pretty critical of this extreme move, and Medusa attempts to apologize and gives that tired old trope of a line, I was just trying to help. On the other end of the call into the Baxter building sits Sue Richards, staring at her lost connection and wondering if Reed cut her off on purpose, but she doesn't want to believe that to be true. Right now, she's at a farm in Pennsylvania, and although she doesn't want to return to Reed, she thinks the safety of her son is more important. Franklin's big freakout in the previous issue consisted of Franklin sitting on a stool and screaming while a ball floated in front of him, and then being temporarily unresponsive when his mother grabbed him. 
Okay, I, I get it. And who doesn't love that vintage car seat in the convertible with the kid riding up front? Wow. As Sue starts driving back, the steering wheel begins to wrench itself out of her hands and the car begins driving itself. Sue quickly places a force bubble around herself and Franklin. The car veers off the road while the mother attempts to protect her son. The car jars them back and forth as it weaves through the trees and then comes to a stop. Whomever brought them here is surprised that Sue doesn't recognize them. Agatha Harkness has been attempting to reach Susan for several days. Well, dang, I'd say she's got her attention now. She thinks that it might be she that might have caused Franklin to start acting out when Agatha attempted too hard to reach her friend. Agatha tells her that she has news to share about Sue and Franklin, but that this isn't the place to share. She then asks Susan to join her of her own free will. The two then leave the car behind, surrounded by scorched grass. A curious sight indeed. The Thing and Mr. Fantastic arrive at the farm Sue is staying at by a fantastic car, after being delayed by a conflict with the Submariner. As they close in on the farm where Sue is staying, Reed apologizes for not doing his full part as a team member over the last few weeks. Truer words might never have been spoken of superheroes when the thing says, Yeah, we all go kind of nutty sometimes. Once the group lands, they learn that Sue left hours ago. Reed then reveals he has another way to track his wife. Since her car belonged to the group, it contains a tracking mechanism which Reed uses to quickly pinpoint her location. Yeah, that's not creepy at all. Reed sees the car below, but Sue is nowhere to be seen. Reed becomes scared when he sees the scorch marks, remarking that he's only seen them once before and that Sue's life may be in danger. Johnny wants to know what's up, but Reed refuses to tell him outside of the fact that it relates to an experiment he's been working on. Reed's new device works like a Geiger counter for antimatter particles brought in from the negative zone. Once they return to the Baxter building, the Thing wants to know if they are going to have to make another trip into subspace, and Reed says that they have no choice. Once they get inside, they realize that Wyatt is no longer in front of the monitor where they left him, and then they see the entrance to the negative zone, smashed open from within. Reed knows it has begun. Annihilus corrects him. The game has already ended. He announces himself, the harbinger of your doom, the agents of your deaths, Annihilus the Immortal. Annihilus, master of his universe, and soon your own. And here he is. Annihilus has done what they always feared. He found a way to cross over. The thing rolls in, bragging about that they have already beat him twice, but two quick punches from Annihilus sends the thing tumbling to the floor. Johnny lets him know that strength isn't everything as he turns his flames on. Annihilus is unfazed. He is no longer affected by fire and counters with a blast from his cosmic control rod. The resulting blast takes Johnny out of the fight. Reed knows that he and Medusa must win this one quick and he asks her to help stretch his body. Reed then releases a wind bomb which contains the force of a concentrated hurricane. The blast hits Annihilus full on. Once the smoke clears, he still stands, unharmed. Annihilus is ready to finish the battle. It doesn't take much, a moment of crackling energy and searing pain, and then all is silence. The Fantastic Four lie defeated. Annihilus is pleased with today's results, but before he moves on to the next step in his plan, he has one more thing he needs to take care of here first. Wyatt begins to rise, and Annihilus lets him know that had he sent one of his underlings to do this job for him, he would have been dead. Wyatt then recognizes who he's up against due to Johnny's description. Wyatt attempts to talk a big game, but Annihilus quickly puts him into his place, binding his arms and manacles. I love that instead of being put off by the manacles, 
Wyatt is instead amazed by how fantastic they are. Annihilus then shares his origin story with Wyatt, but I already covered that in my first video on Annihilus. After sharing his story, Annihilus lets Wyatt know that even more so than taking the life canisters or creating his cosmic control rod, today's accomplishment will give him the ultimate power. Wyatt still doesn't understand why he or the Fantastic Four have anything to do with this, while Annihilus claims they are the crux of the plan. All of them seem to be floating in space within the doorway to the negative zone. And as the issue closes out, that's exactly what it is and where Annihilus is taking them. As he leaves, he boasts that he will get both his revenge and the energy he seeks. As he flies back into the negative zone, Annihilus claims that he shall return for the rest of the Earth in only a short time, and then he flies back home. This story arc wraps up in the next issue of Fantastic Four, Volume 1, issue number 141, also written by Jerry Conway. This issue picks up right where the previous one left off. Annihilus has returned to the negative zone and raises his arms in celebration while singing his own praises. Annihilus, in a moment of reflection, admits that in the positive zone, he isn't as powerful as he is here. He is more powerful than most, but not all, a situation he plans to change. Annihilus takes his captives and lowers them into the planetoid below, promising to return soon for a talk. As everyone comes to, it takes the group a moment to realize where they are, but Reed figures it out right away. Annihilus stands before them and notes that Reed Richards doesn't sound too happy to see him. He attempts to make him more amenable by threatening his family. Behind him, in a stasis tube, is Agatha Harkness along with Sue and Franklin Richards. Annihilus promises that he hasn't hurt any of them, Yet, he was waiting for Reed to arrive before he did anything like that. As Reed rushes forward, the rest of the team attempts to reason with him and pull him back. After the initial rage passes, he sees how he's playing right into Annihilus' hands. The Thing wants to know what the point was behind capturing all of them. Annihilus explains that when Reed stole and used Annihilus' cosmic control rod to save Sue and Franklin's lives, from complications associated with the spaceflight mission that initially gave them all their powers. Once Reed returned the cosmic control rod to Annihilus, it stopped providing Annihilus with eternal life. That conflict seemingly ended with the birth of Franklin Richards, but Reed has always been worried that the effects of his own and Sue's cosmic ray-charged genes could result in Franklin developing into either a prodigy or a nightmare. Annihilus answers the question about the nature of his son for Reed. He tells Reed that Franklin is indeed a monster. Reed bursts out into anger once more, but Annihilus is prepared for him, stopping him in his tracks and temporarily stunning him. Medusa attempts to call Johnny Storm and the Thing back, but the two of them are both ready to charge into the fight. The Thing acts tough, but when he goes for a punch, his arm stops short when it runs into armor forged from a matter-slash-antimatter alloy, giving Annihilus the strongest second skin in the known universes. He then punches the Thing so hard that it causes him to do a backflip. Johnny says those magic words, flame on, and turns into the torch. He's already seen that his fire can't hurt Annihilus, and the big green praying mantis just took down half of his team. Sure, go for it. Annihilus feels the same way, pointing out that he never would have let them wake up if he was afraid of their powers. Johnny surrounds Annihilus in flame. As the heat gets turned up, Annihilus brags that he's explored the hearts of blazing suns and seems unimpressed. Johnny ups the ante and wants to know how Annihilus does against a Nova Blast. Reed attempts to get Johnny to stop, as it drains too much life energy from Johnny, but Medusa points out that it's already too late. As Johnny prepares to go Nova, he's stopped in his tracks. 
Annihilus has grown bored with the bickering and needs to move on to more important matters. Despite such a massive setback, Johnny has the desire to keep fighting, but Reed wants to hear Annihilus out on why he brought them there. Now that Annihilus has control of the situation, he wants to milk it for an audience. He did the same thing last issue with Wyatt. Annihilus promises to tell Reed why he's needed eventually, but first Annihilus wants to share how he got Agatha Harkness to aid him. After Annihilus first became aware of our world, he started watching Susan and Franklin Richards. Because of course he did, and in the process, some of his monitors picked up special vibrations coming off of Miss Harkness. Annihilus suspects that Miss Harkness may have been aware of the observations as shortly after this time she sent the boy away. In order to kidnap Miss Harkness, Annihilus consumed vast amounts of power, opening a portal between our worlds, but once he did so, he easily stole her away. I think the real takeaway here is that Annihilus can now open portals between the 616 universe and the negative zone and just pull people through. She attempted to reach out to the Fantastic Four in the instant before she was transported away. Reed wants to know what happens now, and Annihilus calls for them to be restrained to ensure they are rested up for their transformation. As the tentacles wrap around our heroes, the Thing thinks that all he needs to do is flex to escape, and is surprised when that doesn't work. Reed tells Annihilus that he can't dismiss them that easy. The battle isn't over. And then it is. Just like that, the Fantastic Four stand defeated twice by Annihilus in just as many issues. Our heroes have been deposited into some sort of tower. The Thing finds out that he can't fight his way out, and both Johnny and Reed point out that they are both weaker after having been drained by Annihilus' ray blast. Despite some of the group being drained, Medusa still has a plan, based on Rapunzel. I'm not sure why Annihilus left his prisoners in a cell with a window and a woman who can pretty much grow her own rope at will, but a short time later the Fantastic Four have escaped their cell. As they walk away, Reed suggests that they attempt to get as far away from Annihilus' stronghold as possible. We pick back up with our heroes at nightfall. Johnny is making a fire with much praise from his friends. Reed is worried that the group is in great danger. Ever since Franklin was born, Reed has been afraid that the power from Annihilus' cosmic control rod might have hurt his son. Before Reed can finish his thought, the party is attacked by some of the natural inhabitants of the planet. The thing seems ready for a fight, but Johnny is unsure how long his flame can last. Fantastic Four keeping the upper hand, but it's not an easy victory. Afterwards, Reed corners one of the creatures who, through telepathic communication, confirms Reed's fears. Ever since the Fantastic Four first came to the negative zone, Annihilus has been losing energy. Ben points out that they seem to be getting their strength back, but Reed thinks that means Annihilus will just move on to Franklin. Susan is currently freaking out over what might happen to Franklin. She hopes that Madame Harkness might have a spell to use, but Madame Harkness tells her that her powers in the negative zone are halved. Hmm, that's interesting. Susan wants to know what they can do, and the old lady tells her, only wait and pray. And this is, this panel, yeah, that's what's going on. And sure, any mother would be scared at the sight of that. Annihilus is using his gene transmuter to release untapped rays of energy into himself. The energy currently flowing into Annihilus is refilling him with the power he's lost over the last several months. Soon, Annihilus will amass more power than he's ever held before. Then, he will be ready to conquer Earth. The comic then zooms in on Franklin Richards, and we're told that the lives that are touched by Franklin Richards this day can only end in tragedy. 
creepy and it's accompanied by scary child eyes. Two miles south of there, the wilderness expedition continues. The team comes up with a plan, but it isn't without risk. The torch is going to burrow the team into Annihilus' stronghold, but Medusa is afraid of what might happen if the tunnel collapses. The men all see it Reed's way, and they feel more comfortable taking a chance here than walking in through the front door. For a moment, Medusa hesitates before following the rest of the team into the tunnel. After what seems like an eternity, the team burst through the door only a few feet away from Annihilus. What amazingly good fortune. Annihilus is surprised to see them, thinking he has already dispatched of them. Still, Annihilus sees them as more of an annoyance than any kind of real threat. Annihilus attempts to stop the torch, shooting him with a blast from his cosmic control rod, but the torch has learned that even though he can't fight if he takes a hit from that, he can still dodge its blast. Enraged, Annihilus keeps firing away. The emotional outburst here blinds Annihilus to the arm sneaking up behind him until Reed lands the punch. Reed lets Annihilus know that they've smartened up and changed their tactics. Once the thing gets out, he lands a couple of good blows on Annihilus in return for the ones he took earlier. Susan attempts to call out to the team, but Anna Harkness informs her that they can't hear her. Sue needs to warn Reed about Franklin, and Madame Harkness says that now is the time to see if she can muster up enough of her powers to work. Her words fly true, and Reed hears a message telling him that his son is in danger. Reed turns and sees Franklin's cosmic eyes staring out into space. As Reed closes in on his son, he begins to pick up on his thoughts, and he sees entire worlds and galaxies spread at his feet like toys. The rest of the Fantastic Four haven't laid off of Annihilus. Ben points out that before you can use all of that power, you need to make sure you're balanced. He says this as he knocks Annihilus off balance and into Medusa who in turn uses a broken piece of machinery on Annihilus to swing at him like a giant bat. Annihilus collapses onto the ground, seemingly unable to get up. Ben wonders what's up since one minute the guy was playing God and now he's a pushover. Reed tells Ben and Johnny to free Sue and Miss Harkness so that they can all escape the negative zone together. Ben wants to know what's wrong with Franklin. It's the cosmic rays used on him by Annihilus. They've affected his entire genetic structure. Johnny lets the ladies out, and Reed wastes no time handing his son back over to his wife. Reed wants to know if Madame Harkness has the ability to send them all back to the Baxter building in their world, and Madame Harkness again states that her powers are weakened here, but she can try. I would say that her spells weren't weakened. If anything, it was more powerful than before. And after the comment about her spells only working at half strength, I really expected only half of them to make the trip back. Once everybody returns to the Baxter building, Reed is alarmed because Franklin's energies are building to a critical mass. If they continue rising, Franklin will let loose a blast of psychic force a strong enough blast could kill every living creature in the solar system. The two ladies stand around while Reed goes to work. He grabs his failed antimatter gun prototype, the one from the beginning of the previous issue. Franklin's eyes begin to glow brighter and brighter. Reed walks in with his gun and aims it at his son's head and shoots. Sue screams out in fear, but moments later, the glowing in Franklin's eyes begins to fade away, but with it dies the light of intelligence, replaced by darkness. Reed apologizes, claiming that Franklin was becoming too powerful, and when Sue wants to know what Reed did, he tells her that he shut down his mind. He turned his own son into a vegetable. Reed attempts to defend himself, pointing out that Franklin's energies were going to destroy the world. Sue refuses to accept Reed's answer, and Reed refuses to accept that he could have done anything different. 
The Thing tells Reed that he doesn't have a choice either, and after a move like that, he can't be a part of the Fantastic Four anymore. The issue ends with Ben calling for the end of the Fantastic Four. Annihilus and the web that is woven between him and Richard's family continues to get stickier and stickier. The end of this issue leaves us uncertain as to why Annihilus lost all of his power towards the end of the issue. Perhaps we'll learn the answer when he rears his head once more a year later in the pages of Captain Marvel following the events of the Thanos War. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. Feel free to hit any of the buttons below. I'm out.